<clears throat> okay, all right. Well, hello everyone, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me. All right, well, it's uh, time to go ahead and get things started with all this uh, uh, daughter of fortune stuff. <clears throat> um, and uh, um, and this is going to be the first of uh, six videos in which we go over uh, the various elements of of, uh, of all the of all the readings, because uh, as we go on for these next six weeks. Uh, we'll basically basically be covering about three to four chapters per week of Daughter of, of Daughter Fortune. But in addition to talking about some of the key themes, and some of the key events, and the and the people, the ideas that Allende uh, talks about in the book, I'll also bring in some discussion about events happening uh, in the rest of the world, especially with respect to the United States. And uh, what I'll do for every uh, every week is uh, try to link uh, the the readings in the Who Built America to what Allende is, is talking about, and try to find some connections uh, between uh, uh, be, uh, be, between the two. And, uh, and and time permitting, of course, I'll say things about what's happening in say uh, in say Asia, uh, Latin America, Europe, uh, the Pacific, the, uh, the the entire Atlantic region as uh, we as we uh, go forward for these next uh, six weeks. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get things started. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and by now you know what you have to do with respect to the reading. So again, this corresponds to uh, chapters one through three of Daughter of Fortune. I'll talk about some of those key uh, elements in just a few minutes from now. But first, let me go ahead and get things started and say a few things about what's happening in the United States to correlate with the uh, second part of chapter five of the Who Built America text. Well, just to set things up from where you left off from the readings of last week, the American Revolution had just concluded. Um, of course, a lot of euphoria with that in terms of what, De what, what Jefferson was talking about. You know, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, blah, 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 all of, all of that fun stuff. Uh, but it's one thing to announce uh, these revolutionary ideas that people like Jefferson uh, and John Adams talked about, based upon some of the ideas that people like uh, John Locke, Rousseau, uh, many of the other European thinkers, the European Enlightenment thinkers had talked about. And in essence, what the European thinkers had did, built upon a lot of the ideas that was uh, predicated by the uh, ideas of the Protestant Reformation. That is, this idea that it's time. The Protestant Reformation, if you recall from a few weeks back, set this notion that you really don't need to have, you might say, structured a uh, religion, structured a uh, uh, structured hierarchy, to tell you to have a relationship with a relationship with, with with God. As Martin Luther, John Calvin, and many other reformers of the era mentioned. The idea is to have more an, an, an individual relationship, not depend on others to essentially tell you what you have to do. So the Reformation essentially set this mold of defined authority. The Reformation helped to uh, pave the way for a lot of the origins of, you might say, the uh, early uh, European, uh, European nation states. And of course, uh, and as we saw a few weeks back, we saw how Henry VIII uh, really took that to, to, to heart. Uh, in the 16th century, so by the time he died and his daughter Elizabeth came on the scene at the uh, in the tail end, the uh, last uh, few decades of the 16th century with Elizabeth, that began the rise of the first modern English state. Uh, so, so essentially, uh, my, my point is is that once the revolution ended and the U.S. was uh, free from the British, uh, it was based upon a lot of these ideas and principles of breaking away from established structure and authority. Uh, that people like Thomas Paine really brought to the forefront in 1776, and then of course uh, Jefferson and Adams took to another level uh, uh, during those days in Philadelphia, those hot summer days in 1776. But that was only part of the story because as we get going in the Hubert of America reading, starting from page 236, the idea is how to govern because it's one thing to say, okay, we're, we're democratic, peace and freedom, liberty, you know, blah blah blah, all of that, uh, and all of that, uh, great great stuff. But how do you really govern? So essentially, the main point that the uh, that uh, you see in, in Hubert America is the idea of governance. Uh, uh, who, who, uh, who, who, who governs? Uh, what is the relationship between the federal government and the uh, and, and the states and, and the people? And that's the main issue that was being discussed during the days of 1787 when the Constitution came into the forefront. So, contrary to popular uh, opinion, the Constitution, for all intents and purposes, is really a conservative document. It really sets the framework for having a powerful established federal government, but a government which in the words of Ellis and Hamilton and John and uh, James Madison said that is you extend the sphere of government. That is, uh, their thinking was by having large governments, this ensures a wide open playing space for all kinds of factions, all kinds of uh, groups of people, interest groups to uh, come together and share ideas. In other words, by having a large government, uh, you extend the political space, you might say you extend political freedom for those to discuss, debate, argue, uh, that it's whether you're, whether you're uh, a northern, you like uh, things such as uh, commercial interests, 
trading, uh, trading with, the, with, with Europe, and then maybe later on trading the interest in China, in, in Asia, or maybe more interested in the more conservative elements that is protecting your own individual freedoms, having your uh, um, your small plot of uh, your, your small your small farm, your individual farm uh, stuff that uh, that Thomas Jefferson really really believes in. So you don't. So in other words, you don't really want to have government intrude upon your normal day to day affairs. But as Madison and Hamilton point out, by having this wider range of uh, this uh, this large expansive government, that ironically extends the space of uh, of, of, of freedom for people uh, for, for people from uh, from from A, a to Z. And this is a kind of a lesson that you might see people like Sarah Palin, uh, Ted Cruz, and uh, and others seem 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 to uh, seem to forget or maybe don't know about. But I'll save that discussion for me in my history 109 class. But in other words, the point I'm trying to make here, as we uh, as we lead into what's happening with daughter or fortune, is that the United States is going through a series of growing pains. What is its role? That is, uh, is it a powerful, expansive re re uh, re republic? Is it going to compete with the Europeans with respect to things such as trade? Because even though the U.S. and England will still have, still have some, some uh, problems to sort through up until the 1810s and the War of 1812 and even to the 1820s, the English for, uh, uh, the English uh, for the most part remain as one of the main tra trading par trading partners for the early United States. And likewise, too, as problems with France emerge uh, toward the uh, presidency of, of, of John Adams, uh, the thinking is, well, because we don't like the French, maybe we should side with the English. So what's happening early on, we're seeing, you might say, pro-French factions led by uh, Thomas Jefferson and pro-England uh, factions led by John Adams and, and even more so by people like Alexander Hamilton and to a lesser extent by George Washington, who, of course, would serve the first uh, uh, early two terms as president in the uh, uh, that is from 17, eight, from uh, 1789 until he retires in 1797. Uh, but the gist of all this that's happening here is that as the nation is coming into the uh, uh, early parts of the 19th century, and then more so when Thomas Jefferson becomes president in 18, 1800, takes office in March of 1801, the U.S. is, uh, is trying to find its way, find its niche. Uh, that is, uh, uh, that that is. With respect to ideas such as not 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 uh, not only uh, expanding liberty, expanding freedom to others, and of course by by others, I mean essentially essentially white white men. Of course, the uh, the, the right to vote, the franchise to vote, uh, would be denied to women for uh, uh, for many 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 more years. And and of course, African Americans and Native Americans, they'd have to wait much much longer than that. But the ideas were were, were there. Uh, these uh, themes of expanding liberty and democracy. Thomas Jefferson believed that while he was president, that in order to uh, ensure the growth of liberty and democracy, you have to have land. Land is, is like a safety valve for democracy. So because the U.S. has this interest in uh, uh, not, not, not only so much expanding the abstract ideas of liberty, freedom, and uh, 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 free, free and fair, uh, fair, fair elections, uh, uh, of suffrage, uh, the, the right to vote, for, especially for, for, for white men, uh, you have to have land in order to accomplish these, these goals. And that, of course, is where Thomas Jefferson comes into the picture with the Louisiana Purchase. But the thing is, when you start to expand your, your nation, you begin to intrude upon or begin to push up against what's happening with some of the other countries. And, of course, uh, the French, of course, have been kicked out with the French enemy, where we saw that a couple of weeks back. But the country that it seems to be in the way of uh, the nation's expansion is, of course, Spain. Uh, Spain had, uh, had, had taken over the Louisiana Territory in 1763, and as American settlers start to move toward the west, toward what is now present-day Texas, of course, that area was in Spanish hands, and then when the Spanish uh, government began to fall apart, uh, especially with the death of King, of, of King Charles III in 1788, when his son Charles IV takes over in, 17, in 1788 and rules for 20 years after that, the Spanish Empire goes into a complete tailspin. I get into a lot more of these issues in my Chicano studies and Mexican-American studies class for Southwestern and Mesa, but the point is the Spanish Empire is, is crumbling at the same time the U.S. is expanding, pushing further and further west. So Americans are, uh, from all walks of life are, you might say, getting really interested in what's happening to the west, especially what's happening in the former Spanish territories, now the new Mexican territories, so places like California, New Mexico, and of course Texas are now part of the Mexican Republic after, 18, after 1821. So American policymakers, American uh, thinkers, and uh, 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 adventurers, people of, of, of that sort, 
They're interested in, in what's happening with respect to Spain and Spain's empire as it's crumbling, not just in the Americas, that is, in the North America with Mexico. Of course, what's happening down in South America, entirely the same thing. So, whereas in Mexico, you have Father Hidalgo and Father Morelos, who were the main leaders of independence in 1810, 1811. Down in South America, you have uh, Simon Bolivar, José de San Martín, Bernardo O'Higgins, the great liberator of, of Chile. You have these men who are, uh, who are uh, essentially taking upon some of these ideas because keep in mind a lot of the lot of the works that people like uh, like Locke and Jefferson Adams were, were talking about these were things that were translated there were books and pamphlets being sent to the various ports whether it's in Mexico in, in Acapulco or whether it was in Spain itself in the port of Cadiz along the Mediterranean these ideas began to uh, filter to other parts of, of the world so a lot of these uh, these, mil these mil military men or, or religious leaders, whether it's Hidalgo or O'Higgins or, or, or Bolivar, they like what they hear about, uh, about, about representative government, republican government, uh, liberty, democracy, you know, breaking the power of, of, of the church, uh, more, uh, more, more rights for, for, for man, more land for the people, that type of thing. So as these ideas are filtering into other parts, well, especially in Latin America, uh, that's where a lot, lot, lot of these people like uh, Bolivar, San Martin, and O'Higgins in Chile began to take up the mantle and fight, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, and fight for these ideas against the crumbling Spanish government. The Spanish governments of the 18, of the 1810s and 1820s were very erratic in nature. You had a constant push and pull between more liberal reformist types of ideas led ironically by some military men. And then you had the reactionary rule in which King Ferdinand, this is King Ferdinand VII, comes in uh, in the... Uh, uh, that is during the time of the Napoleonic War. So we're getting into a lot more of the European stuff. Uh, I think stuff that my colleagues who do the world history, like uh, Mr. Bell and others, uh, would tend to get into a lot more detail. But the point of it is, as the Spanish Empire is crumbling and it's, uh, and it's oscillating wildly back and forth between liberal ideas and conservative ideas, this gives, this gives the opening for a lot of political thinkers uh, in Latin America to begin to, uh, to begin to push for, uh, to begin to push for, uh, uh, that is for more, for more uh, things uh, such as liberty, democracy, freedom, uh, free and fair elections, that type of thing. So, in other words, the point of it here, and I'm, I'm going to transition now to the, to the daughter of fortune stuff, is that what's happening in the U.S. in the 17, uh, 1780s, 1790s into 1800, these things filter into the rest of the world. So, uh, so people who are in Mexico, who are in uh, uh, who are uh, who are in, in, in the Caribbean, and here's where the slave uprising in in, in Haiti. <coughs> um, uh, around 1800 into, into 1804, and of course into South America, uh, these ideas from people like Jefferson, Adams, uh, Washington, and, and, and also Thomas Paine influence what's happening in, in, in other parts of the world, especially in Latin America. So we fast forward to about 18, so we're now about 1810, 1820, and Chile is now an independent nation. But Chile has its own, its own sense of growing problems too, because Chile, unlike the United States, didn't have, you might say, the sense of representative rule, that is, uh, committees of correspondence, that is, unlike the English colonies that had their own institutions, their assemblies, their, uh, <clears throat> their committees of, 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 of correspondence, that is, communicating amongst each other, taking care of their own, own affairs, that type of thing. You didn't have that in Chile, and for the most part, all of Latin America. The Spanish Empire, up until about the 18, uh, up until the late 1790s, 1780s, 1790s, you might say really micromanage everything with respect to things such as trade, uh, commerce, uh, politics, bureaucracy, the military, uh, judicial matters, things of this nature. The Spanish structure compared to the English structure was so complex, so convoluted, and so chaotic, but the gist of it was it had the sense of micromanaging. So, in other words, the people of Chile, of Santiago, Valparaiso, other cities, and other parts of Latin America didn't have these ideas of, you might say, self-rule, self-representation. So, this paved the way for, for, you might say, more authoritarian ideas, whether it was from politicians like Diego Portales. Diego Portales was, one of, was the main architect of Chile's uh, constitution, of Chile's rule in the 1830s. So, Allende doesn't talk about Portales, but Portales set the stretch to, you might say, have a really powerful, uh, highly centralized government. And Portales was, was really influenced by the ideas of Alexander Hamilton. So, someone argued that Diego Portales, he was Chile's version of Alexander Hamilton, but much, much more on, on steroids, you, you might say. Whereas Hamilton was tempered by uh, people like Madison and Jefferson, so no Alexander, that's going too far, you can't do that, blah, 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 back up a little bit. 
Portales didn't really have that. So, what, so the point of it is, Chile in the 1830s, 1840s, still had this powerful authoritarian structure, and uh, and this will be the context that we're looking that, that we're looking at uh, in the that we're looking at in the 1830s and 1840s when the daughter of fortune uh, when the daughter of fortune the story actually begins. So, having said that, and I'll say more a little bit more about Chile's politics in upcoming videos. But having said that. Uh, now, Chile, uh, now here we are in the 1830s, and here is where, where our story begins. Because again, she doesn't have the sense of a self-rule of, of governing its own affairs like the United States had. Uh, but some of the ideas of, of powerful government, structured authoritarian government that Alexander Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton talked about, that's being imposed upon in Chile in the 1830s, and that's in essence where our story begins. So our story begins. Uh, in which we meet Eliza Summers. Eliza Summers was born in, 18, in, in 1832, and, uh, and in the first chapter of Daughter of Fortune, we meet, uh, we meet uh, uh, Eliza. And right after that, we know that it looks like Eliza, uh, she's going to be a pampered, and she's going, to, uh, she's going to be cared for by the Summers family, but you might say in the Victorian English tradition, because remember everybody, in the 19th century, England is under the period of Queen Victoria. It's the Victorian era, so very prim and proper, very structured, highly civilized. You know, high tea at noon, all, all of all of that, all, all of that good, good, good stuff. <clears throat> and uh, uh, and it was around this time where it was said that the English Empire never set uh, from sea to shining sea. No matter where the sun was shining, that's where the English Empire was. And of course, the crown jewel for England back in those days was India in the in the 19th century. So the English, of course. Uh, still maintain this prim and proper attitude, and the Summers family definitely embodied, especially in the person of Jeremy Summers, who's, who is uh, Rose's Summers' older brother. So Rose is the matron of the family, she cares for Eliza, Jeremy is the older brother, and then there's the oldest brother, John Summers, who you might say, John is, I guess you could say, the black sheep of the family. He's got many adventures all over the, all over the, all over the world, as Allende points out, once the story begins. So we meet the Summers family. We also meet Mama Fresia. Mama Fresia is the, uh, the curandera, you might say, the faith healer. She's the one who cares for, uh, for uh, uh, Eliza. And uh, right after that, we see that Eliza is almost torn between the prim and proper world of the Summers family and England, but this down-to-earth um, people of, of the land and telling that Mama Fresia and, and her native people, the, the Mapuche people from Chile, represent. So already Eliza is torn from, from the get-go between these two worlds, and that's what we see in chapter one. Other characters we meet in chapter one, we meet uh, Jacob Todd. Jacob Todd is a guy who wanders all over the place. He's got the sense of, of, of wanderlust. Uh, uh, but Jacob is a guy, you might say, who's a free spirit, but also has a strong views about things, about politics, about liberty, about e equality. Jacob taught, I, I would argue, maybe he's like the, uh, like the, like the Thomas Paine of, of, of the story in that he questions things. And he doesn't like the idea of structured religion, as uh, Allende points out in chapter one. So questioning of religion and authority, that's one thing we're going to see quite a bit as the story, as the story uh, begins to uh, 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 progress. And already we see at the end of chapter one how Jacob notices the disparities of people in Chile and and sees the disparities be, between between the rich and, and between the rich and the poor. So again, we meet a lot of the main characters in chapter one, but we get a sense of where Allende is coming from as the story starts to un, un, unfold. Chapter two is called the English, and here and here we see more about the uh, summers a home a family ho home life. Uh, Ayanna talks about some of the rituals of the family, that is how a rose a bathes uh, Eliza while Eliza is growing up as, as, a, as, as, as a young, young girl. Uh, uh, we see in, in which uh, uh, Rose wants to train Eliza, have her go to a proper finishing school, and things of this nature, which of course are very popular back during the, Victor Victor back during the Victorian era. But we also see, uh, so while the Summers try to make, you might make, make say Chile, a version of England, uh, we see that Chile's ancient path, its uh, traditional path, you know, but long before the uh, the Spaniards uh, arrived, uh, uh, we see you might say a lot of those elements come to the for come to the forefront. Uh, Ayanna talks about and talks about some uh, really devastating earthquakes. She talks about uh, flooding. She talks about this time known as as the God's wrath, and she talks about this. Uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> uh, Okay. Oh, kind of lost my last my place here. Just a second, everybody. Oh, she talks about the priests of the the, the Maya. So she talks about how he, so while ostensibly Catholicism is a way to you might say civilize the people of Chile, in many respects Catholicism is imbued upon by the native customs and rituals. That is, people take their ancient rituals and customs but put a Catholic face on it, 
And uh, so even though on, on the surface it's a Catholic Christian custom, behind the scenes it's a native indigenous custom. This is the idea known as religious syncretism. My old professor Tom Davies at San Diego State talked about this stuff a lot uh, in, in the many classes I, I had with him back in the, back in the 1990s. Uh, so Jacob, you might say, seems to be taken in by this idea of uh, going back to these old earth uh, traditions, uh, earth mother ideals, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and it seems that Jacob begins to criticize a lot more and more of the Protestant ideals, the Protestant mores that people like the Summers are trying to impose upon the rest of Chile. So clash between traditional religions and uh, structured religions, that's another thing which begins to continue as the story unfolds in chapter 2. The other person that we meet in chapter 2 is we meet the Del Valle family, we meet Agustin Del Valle. Agustin represents traditional patron system. This is, a, this is an element which was really common in not just Chile but the rest of Latin America as a, as a Spanish uh, landowners, uh, these conquistadores or descendants, they oversaw vast tracts of lands, they created large haciendas. These things were really, really common in the tours in Mexico. Uh, going into the 19th and 19th, 20th century, the Mexican Revolution was the thing which finally wiped out a lot of the vestiges of that old colonial structure. But Chile still had it, uh, Argentina de de definitely had it, so Agustin del Valle, you might say, represents the old-time Spaniard who, who, who has this old traditional patronism in which he's the head of the family, he's the, he's the patriarch, he's got a large family, and all these people work for him, uh, all these people work for him, these, uh, whether they're slaves or a debt peonage, <clears throat> That type of thing. So that's where the that's where the del Valle come in. The del Valle, in essence, represent this old guard of, of people from Chile that is going back into early colonial times. Uh, but we also meet Paulina del Valle, and Paulina, even though she's from this uh, old oligarchic structure, Paulina has her own ideas. So Paulina, in many respects, uh, I think she's like the uh, uh, the dark horse, or the uh, uh, maybe the uh, even though Eliza gets all the attention in the story. I watched Paulina del Valle because she really represents something uh, magnificent as the story un unfolds. And I'll say more about her, of course, as these uh, videos progress. And finally, let me finish off uh, this video with talking about Chapter 3. Chapter 3 goes into 1845. 1845 was the pivotal year, of course, in the U.S. I'll touch upon it in a little bit more time in one of the upcoming videos. Uh, uh, but Eliza is 13. She's starting to show signs of, of, of womanhood. So, of course, Mama Fresa is, is telling her all these things. Uh, uh, well, you're going to be ugly, girl. You're going to think about boys all the time, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, but, but, uh, but Rose says, oh, no, you can't talk about that stuff that down there. That's nasty. That, that's dirty. Uh, we, uh, you know, we, we, a proper women, don't say things like, like, like that. So, so we're getting that sense of clash between, you might say, uh, kind of nat natural love, uh, that is the natural progression to womanhood, to, you might say, trying to deny what womanhood is, womanhood is, is, uh, is, uh, is, is all about. Um, okay, um, as this chapter unfolds, we hear more and more, and more about how uh, Rose wants to uh, ensure that uh, Eliza is, 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 is a proper girl. Uh, Jeremy has, uh, has different ideas about that. So the sibling rivalry, the clashes between, between Rose and Jeremy, which is a constant theme in the story, that begins to emerge here in chapter 3. And then, uh, and then we see the antics of J Jacob Todd. Uh, Jacob Todd is there in Chile ostensibly to sell Bibles, uh, but he doesn't really have his heart in it. He tends to wander off and do all kinds of crazy, wha wha wacky things. And one of the wacky things he, he does is insert himself into the uh, dynamics of the Del Valle family, where there's a, uh, where there's a big uh, brouhaha going in, in which uh, Paulina is in love with this man by the name of uh, Francisco Rodriguez. And uh, without giving too much away of what, what happens, let's just put, let's just say that uh, Jacob's intervention uh, uh, changes things so that the Del Valle family, especially Agustin, can't really do too much. So the end result of that is that Paulina and Francisco uh, get married and move to the and move and, and move to the northern parts of, of, of Chile, away from uh, Valparaiso, of course. And Valparaiso, which is a coastal town in uh, in, in Chile, that of course is where the uh, the main storyline unfolds. And so we get in, go, as we get going in the readings. Okay, so there you have it, everybody. Uh, a quick a recap, a quick uh, a synopsis, analysis, commentary on the, some of the main elements happening in chapters 1 through 3. And then, of course, before that, just a few things about what's happening in the United States in accordance with the uh, Who Built America readings. And, uh, and, ho and hopefully I, I gave a little bit of an attempt to connect uh, 
what the what Who Built America is talking about and what Allende is talking about. But as we get further and further into Who Built America and we get into the 1800s and the 1820s, 1830s, I think we'll see much more of a better connection with what's happening in the U.S. vis-a-vis what's happening in what's happening in Chile. Okay, all right. Uh, I know this video ran, ran quite a bit long, but I want to make sure I cover a lot of these main, main points and give you a sense of what you're to, what you're going to be looking out for. So, uh, as for the duties for the discussion forms, I'm still working on that. So I figure by the middle part or the end of this week, I'll have all of that re ready to go. So, uh, uh, so I'm looking forward to getting some of your earlier comments again. I still want to find out who uh, who wants to be a group leader. So check with me about that this week. Uh, once I get once I find out who's the group leaders, then we can go ahead and start all the discussions. For uh, uh, for the uh, first the uh, three uh, first three chapters. So right off the bat, groups one, two, and three, you'll get going pretty soon because uh, because we do have chapters one, two, and three going on for this week. Okay, that's it from here. That's it from the uh, from the uh, from the uh, French Valley uh, Home Office uh, headquarters. So uh, I'll be back uh, next week as we get into chapters four through seven, and of course comment further on what's happening in the United States. Okay, all right, that's it from here, and I'll see you guys again next week for uh, uh, for the second video about the daughter fortune story.